um, I guess I'll, I'll, I can just do the the quick, uh, you know, we're, we're a CNCF working group under take runtime. Uh, therefore, we follow the CNCF code of conduct, which is available in the agenda doc uh, and on um, in the GitHub repo. Uh, so everyone, please follow the code of conduct. Um, that's a, it as far as interest. If anyone would like to introduce themselves, if they're new to the group or, or anything, um, feel free to do that now. Otherwise, uh, I'm Kai. Uh, I'm you know, part of the Flatcut team, so that's why I'm here now. Great. Nice to see you. All right, then uh, I'll hand it over to you, Tyler. Thanks. Uh, Kai actually reviewed my hastily uh, assembled slides. I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> this week is crazy. Like, there's so much happening. All right, let me share the browser window. Here we go. All right. And hopefully you're all seeing the slides. Yes. Awesome. OK, Jack can 15 minutes. Uh, happy to present uh, my favorite operating system to you folks today. Uh, we have a number of um, like cornerstones in the flat car uh, project and the flat car distro um, that we rely on. And like it, in a sum, like some of those are shared between uh, uh, all specialized uh, special purpose operating systems. Some of those um, are pretty unique, and uh, the sum of them is what makes up Flatcar. So I list them all. Um, the first and foremost, which is the very foundation of the project, we are very user centric, reliable. We are actually unexciting. We want to be boring, and we are proudly boring our users since 2018. That's, um, yeah. The second is uh, we configure the operating system before we provision it. Like nothing has happened yet. We write configurations for uh, Flatka and then uh, we provision it and then it gets automatically updated. Basically, you're never in touch with the instance. Um, that's kind of the goal. And that's what we call zero touch infrastructure. Makes automation and uh, operation very easy. Um, Flatka is image-based, it's immutable. It's very, very minimal. There's no package manager. You can't extend, uh, you can't download like uh, tools or something from, from Flatka releases. It's all included. And what's not in is not available. But we are extensible on the operating system layer. If, if you need that on top of um, uh, you know, operating your container workloads um, at provisioning time using system D so X, that's pretty new. Uh, and we're amazed like that's that's a exciting technology, and we're making use of this a lot. Um, and lastly, we feature a portable and very easy to use SDK. So we make um, the operating system approachable for users, uh, make it easy to, to develop for the operating system and to test uh, and all that. Um, but before we dive into that, uh, we didn't come up with all of this stuff for ourselves. Um, we are standing on the shoulders of those literal giants. Uh, yeah, proverbial giants. And um, so Flatcar started as a friendly fork of the epochal Core S container Linux, which now um, in spirit lives on uh, in um, Fedora container Linux. But uh, I mean, Flatcar is more or less the technological continuation of um, Core S. Core S was based on Chromium S and it borrowed quite a few concepts from there. And that is basically on top of Gen 2. Um, and from that, we derive a few, um, we, we inherit a few things. Uh, we just keep doing it the same way. Our images are always built from scratch from the sources every time, just like Gentoo does it. We build images, they build on your machine. But uh, in summary, it's, it's basically the same. The operating system is immutable. It's shipped as a full image. Um, the updates are also full images, and we're using uh, traditional AB partitioning for updates and rollbacks. We distribute our updates via a stateful protocol that's called Omaha, and the same protocol is powering Chrome OS, so we borrow a lot from there as well. Flatka includes only a very minimal set of binaries and applications, and um, it, it is entirely tailored to do one thing and one thing only, and that's running containers. It uses declarative configuration applied, uh, applied at provisioning time. It touched on that already, and we'll dive into that later, just like CoreOS. That's what makes up Flatcar. But we're driving the technology on top of these. Um, this is our, our, our heritage. 
first thing is uh, the, the user-centric approach of uh, flat cars. So we actually, we dare to bore our users. Um, many distros, general purpose distros in particular, expose a lot of options and opportunities and levers and switches to users. So they can fine tune everything on their distro. That's not how we see ourselves. Flat car is your light switch. And this is important for us as maintainers because it gives us direction, right? Um, so if a light switch comes in six different colors and two of those colors don't switch the light 20% of the time, it's not worth having the colors because you fail at your at your basic principle. Um, so we define flat car uh, by reliability, not by features. We strive for features, of course, but we will always go for compatibility and for re uh, reliability if we need to make a judgment call. Um, and uh, going ahead, um, we define a clear contract between like what the operating system is, what we do, and um, what the user can operate, what the user workloads are. Like there's, there's, it's like a clearly, uh, almost clearly defined API, uh, and that um, that grants us most of the stability and the flexibility that we have on the operating system layer. Um, Flickr is thoroughly tested. It's very important for the user experience. All of the PRs that go into the distro are fully scenario tested uh, before they are being merged. Nightlies are tested. Uh, releases, of course, are thoroughly tested. Um, we offer users an opportunity to test new releases with their workloads via, uh, canary, via canary pattern using the beta channel, more on that later. And we don't do any vendor discrimination. We run equally awesome on AWS, Azure, Brightbox, Brightbox is new, Brightbox, DigitalOcean, Equinix, Metal GCE, private clouds like OpenStack, QEMO, VMware, and of course, Bare Metal. Uh, and all of those are included in our testing, and we, we'll have a look at that uh, in a minute. But let's start with separation of concerns. Like, what do we know by, but what do we mean by um, we're defining a contract? Well, if you, you know, have your naive container application stack here, um, this is what makes a special purpose. So we, we split that in half. We say part of our responsibility is there's always be guaranteed Docker, container D, and the operating system. We, we uphold a contract to all of the upper layers, to the workloads of the users. Um, and that contract's tested. Like, this is our interface. This is where we make sure that we don't break user workloads, right? And that allows us um, a lot of flexibility on the operating system side, while at the same time being very boring to our users. Uh, speaking of tests and uh, making sure that contract is uphold, we have a very complex test suite with more than 100 tests. Some of them are simple smoke tests. Some of them test ed edge cases and basically result from like weird bugs that we had filed. And then uh, we added the respective test to make sure that never happens again. But there's also very complex scenarios in those tests, like deploy a Kubernetes cluster at a CNI, run tests on top of that. Um, and those are executed, uh, as I said, on every PR to the operating system. Of course, on our nightly, nightly covers all of the major platforms that we support. And then um, for our releases on all of the platforms that I mentioned before, um, all of the tests are being run. And if you like on the on the right hand side, you see a, you see a successful test run. And those are the this is the list of tests basically that you're looking at. Um, so this is very thorough. And just you know, splitting those concerns allows us to put the things exactly there uh, to guarantee that users will always have the same user experience. Um, sometimes you have user workloads that are so complex, they can impossibly be covered even by uh, the scenario tests that we have. For this, we offer like kind of a concept that users with larger clusters can sub subscribe to um, and follow and implement a canary pattern. And it works like that. So just, uh, just like an average application, um, and I think most distros nowadays, um, flat car releases are branched off our main development branch and that then first gets an alpha tag, becomes an alpha release, um, eventually uh, is being promoted into beta and stable as it stabilizes, although not every alpha is promoted to a beta, not every beta is promoted to a stable. So this allows us uh, faster iteration. Now, uh, we consider alpha development, even though it passed the full test suite before release. Beta is our stable as far as maintainers are concerned. Um, so users are encouraged to run a few uh, betas on canary nodes. 
and then give feedback if they see something concerning or weird. So they can have they can have influence and impact on the stabilization process. And if they run larger stable cluster, they can always make sure that their stable cluster receives fully tested scenario, uh, uh, um, workload tested releases. And of course, we will never go stable with any beta where we have bug reports on, right? That's that's not the point. So here, um, our users can hook in and can help us with the stabilization process. Um, sorry. Zero touch and automated updates. Um, I touched this earlier before. Um, the, the, the kind of comparison that we like to do here is um, Flatcar kind of handles the same way you would handle your uh, Kubernetes application, right? So you have a YAML that describes what your application does, all of the specifics, the inputs, um, gives you the, uh, takes the application images, and then you apply this YAML to a cluster. And um, your application basically is being instantiated uh, based on app images, um, container images, and then it, it it comes alive. And so this is how we um, how we perceive kind of the way how to operate Flatcar uh, and how to how to deploy Flatcar node. Um, you can configure Flatcar declaratively um, in YAML as it happens, um, and um, you apply that. Uh, either to a cloud provider or you you pass the YAML config you pass, pass the configuration via um, a web address or a, or a IPXE thingy to your bare metal cloud and then your instance is um, created from a flat car image plus the configuration. There is no configuration drift in this scenario. The, the config is applied once at provisioning time and then never uh, touched again. And it doesn't really make any difference whether you know you have a like long living node that has been upgraded uh, on the operating system side a number of times, and then you deploy a new node from the same configuration. Those nodes should be identical, right? Um, so there's no doesn't there's, there's no configuration drift that you need to chase down. Kind of, kind of a weird uh, comparison that we apply uh, to make this a little bit more um, more tangible is if you you know just kubectl applied your application YAML to your to your cluster, you wouldn't want to kubectl exec into pods, change configurations so that your application starts to work. This is not how we want to uh, how we want Flatcar to um, to work. So we kind of strive for the same um, for the same process. Um, yeah, configuration is declarative. Uh, you can write it in YAML. Um, it it is um, used at, at the uh, at the instance. It is um, it is JSON, so you need to transpile it um, as is tradition. You know, you take YAML, transpile it to JSON. That's passed uh, to the automation, and then the automation acts on um, on the configuration. And that that system, butane and ignition, is actually shared between Flatcar, Fedora, Corora. And as we learned recently, um, SUSE microOS as well. Uh, you can automate that. Like if you have um, uh, provisioning automation on your end, uh, there are Go bindings that will programmat pro programmatically create these configurations for you. We use that, um, for instance, uh, with our cluster API integration, which I'll touch later on. Um, also, it, one clear advantage over um, runtime or boot time configurations like cloud in it is if there's something odd with the configuration, if some of the sources can't be pulled or something else is wrong, then your deployment will straight out fail. Like you can delete your node, check what's going wrong, and then deploy again. It's it's it it, it will always be reproducible. The second part of zero touch um, infrastructure is automated updates. Uh, and I've already uh, kind of elaborated on how we make sure that updates don't break anything on your end. Uh, but how do they happen? Well, remember the um, the contract thing that I mentioned earlier? Well, this allows us to fully test new releases at the contract level, make sure that we still um, stay true to our contract. Uh, and then we have a we have a tool in the operating system that would just detect new updates as they become available, stage those updates in um, the not use the inactive partition, um, and then either automatically or externally uh, triggered, um, you would activate the, um, the the new operating system. Your container application would just boot up as it always did. Um, the API, the, the API, the Docker contract is up, upheld. 
So the container application um, keeps running. If it doesn't, rollback is just one reboot away, and um, you basically come up with a known good configuration uh, and known good operating system. But usually that doesn't happen. Um, the container application happily uh, remains running, and um, you've updated without your workload even noticing. All right, to, to sum this up. So we're using the OMAR protocol. It's the same protocol that Chromium has uses. This is a stateful protocol where instances tell the update server, I'm on this version. Is there a new version available for me? Yes, here it is. Um, it's passed down. And it also anonymously uh, gets feedback on how the update is doing uh, in the wild. So if an update uh, is rolled back, then that error would be reported by the nodes to the update server. So when a new update um, is being published, we can actually see if there are any issues out there in the user's fleets when they use our public update server, of course. And if there are any, then we can actually take action before the users even filed the first issues on that. Um, we use the um, Nebraska implementation for that. That server is free um, software. It's part of the Flatcar project. It's available. You can run your own update server. So you can you can decouple um, your fleet entirely from the um, from the public image server and update server that that we're that that we're providing. For the on node update strategies and uh, reboot strategies, we have a number of options that you can pull. Of course, you could just not reboot. Then the update is staged and will be staged until you manually trigger a reboot. You can define maintenance windows like on a schedule. Um, if there's an update staged, only reboot in in you know on that day in in this uh, window. Uh, for like small clusters that don't come with their own control plane, we have um, etcd based um, synchronization where individual nodes can just synchronize an update uh, and make sure not everybody update not everybody reboots at the same time. On the Kubernetes level. Um, Updates can be integrated with QD and Fluo. Fluo is, um, is a flat car project, and QD is um, VFWorks uh, CNCF project. And those basically controlled uh, drain nodes, reboot, and then uncoordinate the nodes um, so the applications can, uh, can go back to the node. It's image-based, mutable, and um, very minimal. We always provision from a full disk image like it's fully partitioned, including the root partition. Uh, at provisioning time, the root partition is just extended to span the whole disk. You can actually pre-populate the root partition by editing the image, that's fine. Um, but you can't touch the, uh, the operating system partition. That's a separate partition, it's slash USR. It's DM Verity protected. Um, and um, the uh, Verity hash is baked into the kernel and initRD. So a, a certain kernel and initRD will only boot a certain uh, operating system partition. And that's how we connect uh, kernels, uh, the, the early boot and, um, and the operating system partition with each other. There's no package management. There's no version drift. Um, any given release version of Flatcar always corresponds to a full software set, uh, a full version set of operating system binaries. Uh, so you don't need to, ch uh, to chase down individual packages and update them. It also it also means that um, software inventory in your classes is pretty is pretty easy. Um, and the operating system itself is a little less than three hundred packages, um, Gen two e-build packages, not packages on the on the image, of course. Um, and it includes the bare minimum to to just run containers. So it's a very um, small attack surface. If you need to um, extend the operating system itself, so if like you know containers just don't do the job and you need to go deeper, uh, we offer extendability versus uh, via SUSEX. So we use basically we integrate SUSEX in the provisioning process. You can you can define SUSEX sources and you can use uh, systemd sys update to up to have your own custom SUSEX updated at your own pace. Uh, entirely independently from the operating system. For instance, um, you could provision your own custom container runtimes like uh, Podman or Cryo. Um, you could provision a full-blown Kubernetes um, distribution. And we do that uh, later on uh, for cluster API as a proof of concept um, in the works. Some people have used it to deploy Wasm recently and to basically just tailor down Flatcar to not run containers at all, just uh, serve as a Wasm host. 
all of that uh, can either be defined uh, to be downloaded at provisioning time in the declarative configuration or even baked into the image. So that, that is an option. Um, yeah, and there are some examples in our SysX bakery. So if you look at that, it's kind of a contrib repo um, that we're maintaining. There's a Kubernetes there. You need a few lines of um, configuration to be added to your flat car deployment, and then it'll come up with a full-blown Kubernetes. Cluster API. Um, we've added support, out-of-the-box support for cluster API uh, to the cluster API upstream project and to image builder. Uh, main work there was to add um, ignition support to core cluster API. So other ignition-based OSs can actually leverage that and, um, and reuse that um, to add support for their own operating systems. We added support to multiple vendors. Uh, we support AWS, Azure, vSphere, and OpenStack. GCP is a work in progress right now. And also, um, because we, we think uh, the, the current image builder concept where you bake Kubernetes and the operating system into a single image and then deploy that um, has several um, disadvantages and is less flexible. So we're working on a SysX proof of concept for all the providers that we um, support. And this will allow you to use stock flat car images um, and then compose it with uh, Kubernetes at provisioning time and uh, you wouldn't be uh, needing to bake your own images anymore. It will also allow to update Kubernetes independent from the operating, operating system and vice versa. Lastly, our portable and easy to use SDK. So this is something uh, that we inv invested a lot of work recently uh, in recent years. Um, it just focuses on you know running a few scripts and then being right in the uh, in control in the seat driver seat um, of uh, Flatcar operating system development. It is used by maintainers, obviously. We use it in our automation. Um, it's the one thing that builds Flatcar nowadays. It is. It is. Um, it includes a, a easy to run full test suite. So all of those scenario tests that we looked at earlier, you can run them locally in a in a QEMO um, environment, and it's all scripted. You just run a script. So to give you an idea, um, to check out the latest, to rebuild the latest alpha and run all the tests. You would clone a single repo. You would um, check out the alpha tag that will put you on the on the alpha uh, maintenance branch. And then there's a wrapper script for the SDK container that we're using. Um, the SDK container is published on GHCR, so it's generally available. Um, you build all of the packages out of the Gento e-builds that are part of the script's repo, so nothing's downloaded. It's all built locally. You build the um, Flatcar OS image from that, and then you create a vendor image for the um, for the QEMO runtime environment. And then you can run local tests, and that'll just pick up the latest image that you've built and run all of the tests. You can, of course, make changes, rebuild the image, and then again run, run the test to see if you broke anything. It's a community-driven free um, and open source software project. Uh, there are no single vendor interests in the project. We have um, maintainers from multiple companies contributing to the project. It has full community stewardship. If you're interested in becoming a contributor, it's easy. We have a lot of uh, work items open that you can pick up. A few of them are labeled with um, good first issue, so it's a good start. Uh, we are very always supportive of new uh, contributors. If you want to take part in the stewardship, um, we are maintainer-driven, maintainer-stewarded project. And um, so, you know, um, a, a, a number of, of consequent and constant contributions will make you a maintainer, and um, then you can help steering the project. You can reach us on metrics and Slack. Our day-to-day -day communications are there. There are always maintainers hanging around there. So if you have any questions or feedback or you know just want to have a chat, uh, please drop by. We have an office hours call every second um, Tuesday at 3.30 UTC. That one is more user-centric um, and less structured. We have demos there. We have users talking about container-related stuff there, operating system-related stuff. So that's... Um, more or less uh, users and ops centric um, meeting. And then we have the dev sync, which is basically our monthly scrum planning, uh, where we look at our roadmap, at the implementation tactical, and at uh, our release planning. And that's every fourth Tuesday, except in December, because um, that's in the festive days. We've, su we've submitted Flatcar to the CNCF as incubating project. Um, 
And the idea here is we are fundamentally community driven and we are cloud native project in that we're not trying to get away, uh, to get in the way of you operating your cloud native workloads. We are entirely focused on cloud native, on running cloud native workloads. So I think we'll make a good addition to the CNCF. We've passed the governance review. We're working with tech security um, and take runtime right now. And um, Danielle actually drives that initiative. So if you want any specifics or updates, she's the right person to contact contact there. Um, the I mean, it's it's a bit new for both of us, right? CNCF is confronted with an operating system for the first time. The CNCF onboarding process is complex, and we're from Flatcar confronted with, them, with that for, for the first time. But the the help and guidance and the interoperation that we that we receive from the CNCF is very very impressive. And I want to use um, each opportunity, every opportunity I get, to uh, give those folks a huge thank you. Proposals right there if you're interested. All right, to wrap this up, Flatcar is user centric. It's boring and it run, con runs containers. It gives you zero uh, touch infrastructure. Um, it's auto updating. There's no config drift. Um, you can't really break it. It's image based immutable. You don't have version drift in the binaries. So um, software inventory of your operating system is very easy. It can be extended on the system uh, level via SysX, and um, it's a fully community driven project. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, uh, I got a question. Um, I found your like uh, versioning strategy stuff really interesting. You're talking about the different release channels, alpha, beta. Um, <clears throat> and you said, you know, you don't really see anything unless it gets, you know, has any pending bugs in alpha or beta, you wouldn't release it to your main line. Um, what, how much usage do you see out of those, you know, pre-release channels and like, is there substantial people using it? Like, because I, yeah. I I would be surprised if people would use it and give you valuable feedback. So I'm curious about how that works and you know what what you know about those users who are using alpha and beta. So alpha isn't really recommended for for people to actually use. We we see alpha usage in 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 very low numbers uh, because people run dev clusters um, and things like that and test out stuff. Um, beta actually has some noticeable usage. I don't, I don't want to call it significant, but, um, and that's because at least, you know, on our public update server, uh, images check in on a certain channel. So we actually see, um, kind of an anonymized um, usage count, uh, per channel. And, um, we, we, we see a few thousand beta, uh, images out there and those uh, instances out there and those regularly update. So they're following the beta channel and that's exciting. Um, we started with a very low beta count. Like that's um, when we um, when we got our first like herds of users coming in uh, back in the uh, 2019s, 2020s. Um, beta usage was was very very low. But um, some uh, operators of larger clusters got to the idea themselves, and some others, you know, ran into issues with their workloads on stable releases. So of course we took care of those issues. But we also recommended: can you check out stable? Uh, can you check out beta? So we kind of grew that usage over time. And by now we're actually pretty satisfied that um, if something hits beta and we don't hear about anything for two weeks uh, or even a month, then this is safe. Uh, to go to stable. Um, just one follow up on that. Do you find like that uh, a given organization might have like a percentage of their servers that are running on like a, a beta release, and then the majority are running on you know stable? Um, or do you think that have, like an... we don't have insight to we don't have insight into organizations? Uh, it's it's just raw counts, and I, actually we'd like it that way. <laughs> Um, sure. Because we don't really want to uh, re check on our users too much, but um, so we haven't heard like we 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 do major okay. jumps right between the stable releases. You have a stable release every three to four months, and um, because we keep all of our um, stuff up to date, there there are major jumps in in inversions uh, on the operating system bits. We have major kernel jumps. We, we usually um, include the LTS kernels. But uh, even then, you have a, you have a switch, right? And this rarely has any repercussions, even for beta. But um, okay. if there are repercussions, <clears throat> we're more likely 
to get bug reports on the betas than on the stables by now. Okay, I think that makes sense. That makes sense. It, and one thing that you said in there that kind of was like, wow, I'm surprised by that. You're changing kernel versions on users and users are okay with that? Sure, yeah. That's, I mean, the, the, the kernel is of course, like parts of the kernel is of course uh, a part of our contract because um, the container images rely on certain kernel features, right? To not break. Um, I think the only major potential feature that we, uh, the, the only major feature that we introduced, which potentially had friction points was the switch to C groups V2. Right. Um, so I right. mean, many, many Kubernetes components were really late um, with C group V2 support. Um, so we we offered we lo we, we had a long time uh, like a comp compatibility mode that we automatically detected from running nodes, right? Like if a node updated to, to C groups to um, a release that defaults to C group V2, and it was on C groups V1, then we would automatically apply this compatibility mode and um, stay at that and basically give the users an opportunity to do all of the legwork um, to uh, make sure their workloads don't break. But new um, new provisionings, those started with C groups v2 by default, right? And uh, even then, I think we had, let's call it one and a half major feedback items that we needed to tackle. And all of those users were just happy with our solution. And yeah, if you absolutely need that for the next six months or so until you migrate it, if your workload's that big, so changes are that painful and well, at the end of the day, expensive. Yeah, here's the kernel command line that you pass and then everything will just remain as it is for the time being. Um, but even even that was caught. Um, I think I think one, uh, one uh, larger user ran into that in stable but some other users have already reported that in beta <clears throat> and we had all of the documentation ready uh, to help that one user who then, by the way, started using beta nodes. Mm, fascinating. Okay, great. Yeah, and, oh, I, I, I missed the, the second part. So all of the other stuff, uh, just because of the thorough test suite um, will, will always work. Uh, because it's it's already been tested. Like the same tests run run successfully on the old kernel and the new kernel. Uh, the tests basically define our contract that we have. As long as we uphold that, um, shipping a bump from I don't know five fifteen to six one should be absolutely seamless for the users, right? This is this is why we do all of this um, this testing. That's that's really interesting because our users just don't want new kernel versions. Like they would just stick on a rather stick on a insecure version than switch kernel versions. Which, so we have this um, LTS channel. Um, yeah. And so we are not forced to uh, subscribe to all these major version updates uh, that can come in every few months. So, I, so maybe also to, to talk more about this automated update. So you're not forced to do automatic updates. You can control this manually. You can go with your own pace with this own update server even. And you can do even individual node jumping to newer versions uh, on your like it. So, and um, but if you really don't want to have new versions coming in for systemd or the kernel, you can use this LTS channel that we have, and then you have like more than one year um, of kind of only bug fix updates for the kernel. And uh, yeah, so users are on that channel as well, but I guess beta is slightly more even than LTS at the yeah. moment. Yeah, that's. I was about to say that, that's funny. I mean, yeah, we absolutely have the LTS um, thing and that was a thing back from the um, the old Kinfolk days when we actually, we, when we were a single vendor to Flatcar um, and we, are, we, we were, uh, you know, helping our customers with support contracts. So they asked for that. We, we created this LTS channel back then, and we now just made it available to all of the community uh, because it doesn't make sense to have that concept anymore now that development sponsored across multiple big organizations. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a, I think a third of the better users use, uh, a third of the better instances are, uh, instance counts are on LTS. So it's, it's quite a low usage. Um, 
Although this is only what we see in the update server, right? Uh, so the traditional company using LTS, they would, you know, spin their own images and disable updates entirely and do AB updates. Um, so blue, blue, green updates in their in their nodes. Um, I, I second the kind of the, you know, the hesitance of upgrading kernels. I, I get where this is coming from emotionally. Um, so the way there's 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 two answers to the to these concerns, right? The, the first is please use beta canaries. If you see something on beta canaries, tell us, we'll integrate it in the test suite, make sure it never happens again, fix the problem. And then after that, the stuff will hit beta. So those two kind of um, uh, concepts really help here. Really interesting. Thanks for the, the insight. Kind of curious about that test suite because you, it looks like you really are covering a lot there. Um, is that something that was custom developed for Flatcar where to make it easy to to just drop in new test cases to cover? Or? No, I think I think it originally so we're using a uh, let's call it custom spin of the Mantle suite. So Mantle was a thing that comes with Chrome OS. Um, it handles publishing. It talks to cloud APIs, and it also includes a test subsystem called Cola. Um, this was largely widely extended by by core os and we're just using this and we we keep adding tests i think when we when we took this uh, over when we became an active fork um of core os uh, we had like 70 ish tests and it's now more than 100 um particularly the the kubernetes and the cni scenario tests uh, i think ebpf is also something that we added um very specifically to make sure that we uphold this 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 one contract in principle, um, Mantle is extensible, Cola is extensible, so you could run it on other uh, distros. There's a lot of Flatcar specific um, stuff in there. There's a contact. Uh, there's a there's a concept in that tool which allows you know multiple distros and then whitelisting individual tests for the respective distro you run on. Um, if your distro is um, is supporting ignition, it makes things a lot easier to reuse Flatcar tests because that's how we kind of parameterize most of the deployments um, that are running during tests. But I mean, in general, you can extend it and benefit from the from the general test cases that are in this test suite. Nice. Does it, does it spin up a flat car instance for each test case or? For um, most. Uh, yeah. We want to make sure to start with a clean slate and not have any. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it can be. It can be. Um, uh, kind of staggered in, in the test code itself. Uh, so you have, for instance, we have some basic smoke tests that just reuse and run on the same instance, just because is this tool there? Does this tool generate the expected output and stuff like that? Um, and then I think one of the Kubernetes tests um, just you know provisions Kubernetes on, on a few nodes. And then after that, uh, the CNI test runs on those nodes. So it's basically it's building on top of each other, but in general we're trying to to start from a clean clean slate, um, and it, it's not even that expensive. I mean, the QEMU suite on my laptop takes about thirty minutes to complete. Um, it's a it's a powerful laptop uh, with lots of RAM, but um, but still, I mean, that's impressive. Cool. Thanks. Anything else? I have a bunch of questions. Um, not, not so just uh, very basic in a way. <laughs> so uh, if there's no other topic, I can talk about that. So um, yeah, I've always been thinking uh, in the CNCF, the containerization, everything should be containerized and all that. So, um, but from an operating system perspective, why do you expect public cloud, such as you know, AWS, for example, uh, is going to switch all to all containerization and no virtual machine? Is that going to happen from the OS perspective? And if not, why not? I think those are different things. So with virtual machines, you slice and dice um, real hardware, and this is this is what 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 that is about, right? And um, containers 
don't really work that well in this regard. Um, they're, they're too complex uh, to parameterize to do that um, outright without a um, thin and uh, high performance virtualization layer between the actual bare metal and, and the container that is running. Containers are great for separating applications from each other and from uh, separating applications from the operating system as, as we've seen in the uh, presentation today, but they're not very good to, um, you know, cut a big machine into smaller slices and then sell the slices. Yeah, the reason I'm saying that is on the, at least on the edge computing side, there is a, ten, a tendency to say, you know, the, the latest, the greatest, it used to be containerization, now more of talking about WebAssembly. So um, what just kind of for the containerization part, is it going to happen like on the if it can happen on the edge computing side everything no more virtual machine everything will be containers why not in the public cloud in edge computing it makes much more sense because usually you don't slice and dice a single edge device right because it, it's very limited in resources already so um it in a way it is already single purpose so you just run your bunch of containers there in order to have your your one app that you're running there um, a cloud providers um, operate like massive machines. There are no small machines in cloud providers data centers. They are all very, very big. Um, and the way to imagine that is for this, for instance, for the smallest instance type that you get. Um, this, this, like this instance type runs on. Um, there, there's like a. Hmm, how do I approach this? Uh, if you, if you actually, that's a good way. If you check instance types and instance configurations of, I think all public cloud providers, you'll notice something um, that if you take the largest instance, you can always cleanly break it down into uh, configurations of the smallest instance. Like there are no CPUs, there's no RAM being left. Um, so the idea is to build a super big machine um, that can run the largest or a few of the largest instance instances, but be dynamic enough to fill those large slots with like many, many smaller instances, right? Um, and that's why those instance sizes starting from the smallest usually double. Um, and this is what this is about. It's just um, getting your, uh, saturating your hardware, your physical hardware, with um, as many slices as you can as as you can i don't see that in edge computing right edge computing is on on very small devices and virtualization um even though it's efficient nowadays poses a significant overhead so it's it's always a trade off um containers are way leaner and way offer way higher performance but at the same time don't really allow you to you know cut your uh, edge computer into half use the one half for one thing and the other half for something entirely different, which is what happens in the data centers. So it's all use case driven. So, but so the name so, is maybe a bit uh, misleading. So it's flat car container Linux, but you're not forced to run containers. You can also run directly binaries. You can run VMs, but you have to bring your um, virtual machine monitor. So I don't, I don't know, you run maybe Kemu as, uh, as binary or as like inside the container you start Kemu. I mean, there's no, the container is not really uh, a problem. It's just a way of shipping the software in the end. And you can also run Rasm stuff on Flatcar. And Flatcar is more about how the OS is optimized for automatization. automatization. So that's maybe the main case here. Yeah, yeah. So you guys done like... anything? Sorry. Go ahead. Has anyone experimented with like Qvert or something like that of, of... Running VMs, um, you know, you know what would be normally a containerized environment. Yeah, people use that. Yeah, or Kata containers is the yeah, other I mean, way. I was have... about, to, I was about to mention that. Um, there's there's a new buzzword called confidential containers, and uh, Kata basically um, provides a thin virtualization layer, implementing just that. Um, but it is accessible using the Kubernetes control plane. So you can basically use the, the operational tools that you're used to um, to operate and orchestrate what is under the hood, actually, a virtual machine. Uh, 
So basically, your 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 take is the uh, because the multi tenancy requirement. That's why edge is for good container and and the core. Uh, the state data center is is not good for containers. Virtualization is still virtual machines still needed. Right? Is that right? From the user side, that's that's exactly kind of the statement that I mean. But I would I would I would turn the statement on its head, right, and start with the hardware. So I I have in a, in a data center I have this huge machine, because actually um, buying one huge machine uh, is at the end of the day a lot cheaper than buying hundreds of small machines. It's also operationally easier and whatnot. Um, on um, on edge, I'm trying to just minimize um, the performance and the hardware that I that I need to spend money on directly on on the edge device. So I don't I don't want to you know cut it down. Um, so I'm looking for the leanest thing that I can operate on the edge device, which is um, which can be containers, which just can be uh, like wasn jobs. And on um, and that would saturate the the device because I've sh I've shrunk the device before I even created uh, the specs for the device right to fit that purpose. On uh, at, in the data centers, it, it's exactly the other way around. I go for the biggest thing that that money can buy. I don't really you know tailor it to any use case as it happens on the on the edge side. And then after that, I'm trying to you know slice and dice this hardware to sell like individual uh, tenancies on that hardware um, and to you know get the hardware saturated so it, it makes its money back. I see. So containerization is more of a how you do sort of a cloud native DevOps. It can happen both data center and in, on the edge, whereas on the edge, there's no need for a virtual machine to do the uh, the things that you mentioned that uh, segregate. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and have a, not, another follow-up question then is on the um, now on the edge, um, there seems to be like for example a web assembly. There, there's even in cases there's you can even run it as embedded on no OS, right? There are also things like unikernel, things like that. Um, what's going to happen there? I know it's a big, <laughs> just a kind of interesting. Uh, like also on the hardware level, is there anything that can change on the hardware level that can make that you know, edge can, the edge side to make the whole OS thing uh, change in, in some way? I don't know. Did you get the, uh, what I'm trying the, to say? The question, the question makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, I would defer the the hardware question because I'm I'm not a hardware person. Um, I started actually my my career with hardware design, but that was um, twenty five years ago. I'm pretty old. Um, so the question of whether to use a unikernel or um or a special purpose operating system like Bottle Rocket or uh, SUSE Micro OS or Flatcar um, on edge. First of all, you, you have the, um, the, the DevOps part, uh, Kubernetes or whatever your, your control plan orchestration is that would abstract it for you, right? So you're not even confronted with the itty gritty bits um, if some systems engineer has provided uh, the, uh, the lower levels um, appropriately. Now, I think it's very it's very use case specific whether you want to use a unikernel um, on an edge device. So it depends what that edge device is made for, what it does. Edge devices are tailored to specific use cases, and um, there's this there's this slider, right? When we're here, we have a specialized operating system, and here we have a uni unikernel. Um, the the further you go to the unikernel side. Um, the more of the specialization you have to do on, on the operating system level. Like it, it can only be for this device. It can only be cover those use cases. It is very limited in terms of updating, in terms of what it even ships. Um, while when you while you if you if you go into the other direction on the on the special purpose operating system side that are compared to a unikernel, pretty general. Um, you can basically reuse uh, open source work. You can you can apply all of your Linux distro knowledge, and um, you you can provide a much wider range of use cases to the embedded system, to the edge device, at the cost of more resources. Right? Um, something comes to mind where we we had a chat with our user in a in a metrics channel recently, uh, and they were running out of out of memory. 
like they had a two gigabyte memory device and um, some some containers just exhausted uh, memory usage on, on their end. Um, and we actually, uh, we helped them by putting them on the on the news flat car releases that ships everything with SysX. Um, and um, that basically reduces RAM usage compared to how we ship Docker in particular be beforehand. But that user, I mean, two gigabytes of memory is super low. You need to tailor even flat car for that, or um, you use a specialized operating system and um, uh, so you use a, you use a uni kernel and you do all of that specialization uh, just for that one device. It's um, it's kind of a trade-off and uh, they are both they are good arguments for going uh, like either way. Basically, you're saying the abstraction layer need to happen somewhere uh, so that the, any hardware can be abstracted. So it's either on the operating system level yeah. or in the WebAssembly case, WebAssembly need to have a different image for a different hardware target, basically. Or or you don't have any abstraction, right? And everything's just baked into the unikernel, but then you have to maintain separate uh, unikernel releases, uh, even for devices with smaller hardware changes. Makes sense. Yeah, thanks. All right, anything else? Um, I wanted to bring up if there is no further questions. There was a discussion in uh, the Slack channel regarding the proposal for FOSM. So just because the timeline is a bit tight, maybe we could use this time to touch upon that. <laughs> Kyle, do you want to speak about it? I can, sure. Um, I've put a proposal in the Slack channel uh, to do a little very similar thing to what we were proposing to do at um, KubeCon Paris, I guess. Um, functionally, just kind of a um, a uh, panel discussion about social purpose operating systems. Um, I know we've had people volunteer flat car, right, Danielle, and myself, and then micro OS from SUSE. Um, any other, myself from Bottle, Bottle Rocket. Um, yes, thank you, Sean. Um, there's the Slack thread in the chat. Um, does anybody else want to present with us? And I think we need to turn that in tomorrow, Friday. Uh, technically Sunday, but I'm not gonna push buttons on Sunday. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure we one we're okay with it. Two, we're not missing anybody who wants to participate. Yeah, so I'd like to participate. If Danielle uh, mentioned something in the Slack channel that um, she is not sure about follow them, um, but will be in the in the KubeCon panel. So if 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 that's okay, then um, I'll be there for flat car in the. Pause them. Okay. Yeah, I think I got that backwards then. Yeah. So we'll put you down. Um, I don't know how flexible FOSDEM would be as far as changing presenters, but it should be fairly easy. Um, the other question I had, there was a, a specific question with regards to licenses, which I can probably look up uh, for those um, particular operating systems, but um, it might be more efficient if there's for everybody just to, to give the uh, licenses that are involved. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, we got a few of them. Yeah, but yeah all, we do too. All, all, of, all of them are open source licenses. We got MAT, Apache, yeah. and GPL. That's that's yeah. roughly it, right? Can you? Right. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I think we can take the rest of this asynchronously if there's not any other discussion on it. I'm, but I'm glad to add people and um, you know make changes as needed. I, I just banged it out as fast as I could so we can have someone to talk about. Thanks for the for the work. Greatly appreciate yeah. it. And thanks for the title, which I, <laughs> I stole directly from you. It was a control C control V. Just a good title. All right. I do like that one. <laughs>
the other thing that was brought up in that channel was was an actual uh like this meeting face to face um but I, I think that would be great if if there's at least a some group of us that are there um yeah there there's a lot of beverage places around the venue uh, or around the area that even if we just go grab something to drink and hang out together that would be a lot of fun Okay. Sounds good. I, I, I totally agree with that. Yep. Oh. So see you around. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I guess that's it for today. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.